Hi friends, Katherine Korostoff here from Research Rockstar. Thanks for joining me today. Today's topic, insights democratization, or if you prefer, the democratization of insights. You hear the phrase both ways. Now, when you hear the phrase, what comes to mind? Well, for me, it's about that aspiration that we've had in organizations for years now, the idea that we can break down different data silos. After all, organizations that are really embracing data-driven decision-making and being customer-centric have had a number of data sources that are about their customers, about demand, um, about their competitive landscape, et cetera. And a lot of this data now comes from many different silos. So you've got different functional areas within an organization that are collecting and analyzing data. The goal, of course, is to break down those silos so that we can have a more complete holistic view of customer data so that if there are important relationships between those different data sources and the data that they're capturing, that we're getting that, that we're not missing some big picture or some big competitive opportunity because the data is siloed. What a tragedy that would be. So we've been talking about this for a few years in market research. And one of the things that I was thinking about when we were going to be doing this, um, this topic today um, with our special guest, who I will introduce in just a minute, um, I wanted to see how long we've actually been talking about insights democratization. So I went online, did a little research, being the researcher that I am, um, and I wanted to see when was the first time the phrase was used in print or was referenced or you know, somebody was quoted maybe in a video or an interview or something. Now, granted, I didn't do a ton of research on this, but I did do a little bit. And the, uh, the farthest result I found was from 2016. Not surprisingly, from two of my very favorite market research experts, uh, Ray Pointer and Annie Pettit. And some of you may know Annie Pettit. She's been a thought leader in our space for a long time, and it's done a great job for years now of really identifying and help uh, promote and educate our market about best practices and, and so forth. She's currently the chief research officer at E2E Research. And Ray, of course, is also a thought leader. Many of you have probably seen him speak at trade shows and such. Um, Ray is a wonderful resource, and he is the chief resource officer of a company called Platform One. I'll put their contact information in the show notes. And um, at this point in 2016, apparently Ray was giving a presentation where he was using the phrase and Annie captured that and she published it in her blog. So that was the oldest reference I could find to the phrase. Okay, but that was several years ago. How much has happened? And why is it taking so long? Well, one of the challenges, of course, is that to some extent, when you have silos within an organization, data or otherwise, um, there's business process. And business process change is a really hard thing. I know that might sound trite, but it's really, really true, especially with organizations that are big enough to actually have data silos. So these types of things really can take time. Also, frankly, there haven't been awesome um, mechanisms or awesome processes to make it happen. After all, if you've got data that's coming from different sources, maybe it's transactional data, primary research data, like we work with often in market research, syndicated data, third-party data, you know, the engineering that's involved in bringing these different types of data sources into a single mechanism, it it's definitely not an easy process. Um, and some of you may have heard the term data engineering, or you may want to look that term up now. So there is a lot of work that goes into this. The good news is that, of course, technology has also evolved since 2016. And so now there's a new set of companies coming into the, um, into the data analytics and market research spaces, which do overlap these days, um, that are really optimized for uh, facilitating that. Um, so for facilitating how you can create a silo-free um, holistic view of customer insights. Um, and there's a, um, a few different companies that are in this space now. It's definitely moving in the right direction. We're getting some great momentum in this space. And so today I have the opportunity to interview the CEO and founder of one of these companies, Stravito. So I'd like to introduce to you um, my guest for the co uh, conversation that I'm having, uh, having here today uh, with um, with Thor. Uh, Thor Olaf Philogen is the CEO of a company called Stravito. And again, I'll put the contact information in the notes. And the interesting thing about what Stravito is doing is they are harnessing the power of artificial intelligence. Um, and they're 
um, just really being quite innovative and uh, pushing the envelope, as we say, right, um, about trying to make this type of mechanism as easy and intuitive as possible so that people throughout an organization don't have to be experts in how to use a platform, right? It's the idea is that it's extremely easy, that there's things that we can do to set things up so that people can get all of the data they need. It's not just, I'm going to go to this one place to find a single report. Um, they're really breaking it down to the data point level so that you can identify topics and themes that actually may be pulling data from multiple data sources in the system. Um, so I think that that's really very much aligned with what we all aspire to, that it's not just, oh, I can get a copy of that report we did last year. It's really about getting down to the data level so that you can identify important topics and themes and get all of the data that would be relevant to that. So um, one of the things I also want to point out about Thor that I thought was really fascinating is that before he founded this company, he was an insights executive. So he understands what the pain is of trying to break down silos and how to try to make sure that an organization truly is leveraging many different sources of data. Um, and you know the importance of removing the friction that often exists in that process. So uh, please join me in welcoming my guest Thor and I hope you find the conversation useful. Thanks. Hi Thor, thank you so much for joining me here today. I know we have some mutual interests, so I look forward to our conversation. Um, now, one of the things that we've been talking about, you and I, just before our call was that sometimes these days there, we have market researchers who are really under a lot of pressure to write shorter reports, right? Whether it's their internal stakeholders or external clients, everybody wants shorter reports. Nobody has time to read big reports. But from the researcher's point of view, sometimes when you're pushed to do really short reports, you feel like, Am I not giving them all the context they need to really understand the data and be able to use it well? I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or experiences on this sort of tension between wanting to make sure people have the information and context they need, but still wanting to give them the bite-sized information that they're craving these days. I think it's a really good question. And I think one of the, the main points of research is to, to give decision makers a solid foundation to act. If insights workers can efficiently find, sort, and understand information contained in both internal and external data sets, they're more likely to find the right balance between reports that are too long, not detailed enough, and that's also what we are trying to help with at Strabito. And if, if I mention a bit what we do, we provide a platform that makes it easy for users to search for, but also to find and to integrate research. Uh, so users, as a user, I can simply type uh, the research or the core topic of interest into Stravito's search bar. And then what will happen is our AI powered search will pull in the accurate reports, uh, highlight the, you know, the relevant results, and then also highlight the relevant insights and the key findings within each document. Um, and from then on, the user can then decide if they would like to read through the complete research or if they find that the findings that are being shown and highlighted are enough. And um, I think that's kind of a, a solid foundation. And what, what we've also done is we've developed a number of features that allow our users to explore research in as much details as they like. And um, really a great way to, I would say, highlight information in, in a digestible way. And, so, uh, so I do have yeah. to interrupt you here, though, because I think there's two different scenarios that we're really talking about, right? So sometimes the business decision maker is, has uh, funded a study. They've, they're asking for a study on a topic. Um, so there's two different scenarios. There's the, I'm delivering a, a report um, on a specific study. And then there's the idea of a repository that has access, as you say, to many different types of data sources. So I think those are two different really questions. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the first one and then, and then come back to the second one. Yep. So specifically for the scenario of, I've got this tension of, I've just delivered this, finish the significant study. I mean, maybe it's a market segmentation study, or maybe it's a really important new uh, branding study or competitive analysis. And I know they want something small, but I need them to get context. Now, if I think about the first part of your answer, 
if I recall correctly, I think what you're even suggesting is maybe we don't even send them a report. Maybe the first access is some sort of dashboard access where they simply can go in and self-serve from the report that has just been uh, from the research that has just been completed. Am I understanding you correctly? Exactly. That's really what I'm trying to get to, because I think what uh, the way we've thought about it is uh, we've, we basically serve reports in context, which means that we have something we call collections that work a bit like playlists on Spotify. And in, in, in a playlist, you can have multiple songs. And in a collection, you can have multiple data sources. So you could have a report, but you could also have a Power BI dashboard that highlights a key topic. You might also have an integration to say statistic your monitor that highlights a couple of trends that are core in highlighting some of the main things that you want the reader to to effectively benefit from so i totally appreciate what you're saying but i got to play devil's advocate just a little bit in the interest of candor here um, i've done over the years a lot of dashboard projects um, back way, way eons ago when it was like brute force dashboarding way before Tableau. Um, and one of the things that I have found, and hopefully you're going to be able to tell me that this has all been fixed by now, is that when people, business decision makers who are too busy to read a research report, come to a dashboard, they um, don't use it as much as they think they're going to, or they didn't back in the day, use it as much as they thought they were going to, because it was almost too much information. You know, they wanted to be more spoon fed. So is there a way to make it so that it's, you know, it fulfills their their need for something short and to the point, um, but doesn't require them to have to take the time to really think through, oh, what do I want to filter here? And what do I want to access here? And what pull down here? Do you know what I mean? Mm, absolutely. And just to, to tie it to my own experience, I, I started the data and analytics team at, at Zettel, which is uh, now part of PayPal, which is their uh, one of their SME you know, payment solutions. So I've been part of building that team. I saw that team grow to, to quite a large team. And I experienced what you just described. You serve people a dashboard and you're really excited because you think it contains so many good answers. And then you end up with something that very few people actually use. Uh, so I, I, I fully understand that. But I think the way we need, I think we need to think about this is that it's related to what I would call the consumerization of the enterprise. So at Strider, what we believe is that for self-service corporate software to actually work, it needs to be personalized. It needs to be fun, it needs to be easy, and it needs to be as fun and easy as consumer applications. And when I say consumer applications, I refer to what you use outside of work, stuff like Netflix, like Spotify. So it's only when you get that level, and traditionally this hasn't existed in enterprise software, and I think that's kind of where our belief comes in, which is simplicity first. There's no point in being feature rich if your user experience is poor. And, and when you invest in software for your company, it's only worth it if people log in and use it frequently. So what I have been with the team is really hard at work at you know, offering simple self-service access to insights through focusing on providing our customers with a fantastic user experience on an easy to use platform, no convoluted training required. And really what we can see is that this drives high adoption rates among our customers. And we are you know, fortunate to include brands among our clients, you know, world leading brands like McDonald's or Comcast or Burberry to just name a few. Um, thank you for sharing that. And I, I really do appreciate it, which is a great uh, segue to my next question, which is about sort of examples. You know. I know a lot of insights teams where they primarily share information on SharePoint or other, you know, basic, you know, very conventional server types of uh, infrastructures. Um, and obviously, like you say, we want to get the information everywhere in an ideal scenario. Uh, people will be able to easily. And I also like your use of the word fun way to make sure that people are going to engage with this sort of platform. So do you um, perhaps have an example that you can share um, of a company? You know, what happened before and after? So before they were doing this, after they deploy a, a smarter solution, um, what was the impact on sharing information? Absolutely. So um, we actually just published a fantastic case study with uh, the luxury fashion brand Burberry on our blog. And basically what that 
case study details is how we work with them to create the Burberry Insights Hub. Now, like many global organizations, before the introduction of the hub, in the case of Burberry, insights often sat in silos and they were often difficult to access. And this in turn created inefficiencies for teams. And this was true both on the producing and on the consuming of the insight side. And crucially, what then happens is that would slow down, you know, both day-to-day -day and day-to-day -day work, but also high level strategic decision-making. So, Whilst Burberry had a very well-developed digital landscape, you know, and they used use tools like SharePoint and OneDrive to stare, store general knowledge, it really needed a bespoke solution to activate insight engagement. And that's where we came in. So what we did is we designed something that was specifically for the Burberry's, you know, very time poor corporate audience. I think I just want to emphasize that time poor corporate audience because what we, when we work with them uh, to create the, the Burberry Insights Hub, we were able to apply our technology to combine AI with user-friendly experience uh, to effectively allow for insights at the fingertips of the employees. Again, no convoluting manuals, no training required. And it was really placing insights in one place that allowed Burberry to move forward to a single source of truth within the organization. That in terms allows them to achieve clarity and also a common thread through, you know, which is a common thread through the solution, the hub. And if I take a look at what has happened is what that means is for them, it has quadrupled the volume of insights in 12 months. But it's true, you know, to activate insights engagement throughout is a complicated matter. And um, in their case, it also serves as almost like a curated live newsroom you know, that delivers timely collections of insights across Burberry. And um, the way to think about it is that the live insights hub not only allows Burberry to distribute insights at scale and quickly, but more importantly, it delivers consumable and timely insights that help create a narrative around insights focused around key specific business topics. All right, so this all sounds fantastic, but you mentioned something that definitely made my ears uh, prick up, which is you say that it, it quadrupled the volume of insights. How are you measuring that? That's a really good question. And I think uh, the, the way we look at it uh, is it's really the amount of information that goes out to, the, to benefit the wider audience. When you have a silo, when you have the silos of information, what really it means is that you might have a lot of information, but if it doesn't reach the potential consumers, it's really not to the benefit of anyone. And I, although I don't remember the details of how that was calculated, I believe that's the general principle. Okay, so the idea is that quadrupling the volume of insights is the source material. So, um, so now I may have access, and please correct me if I'm interpreting this incorrectly. Uh, so I may have access now on my hub um, to primary research studies that have been commissioned, syndicated services, um, perhaps, customer data from transactional databases or uh, customer support um, data sets that may be available for mining, um, other types of internal, for, you know, first, first party data types of sources as well then? Yeah, so I can't comment on the specific for any client, but what I can okay. say is that uh, typically what happens is when we come in, we not only allow you to surface all the data that sits on people's computers. You know, the problem with people leave the building, they often take their knowledge with them. You know, so you have this organizational memory loss. That's the first type of data that we help uh, uh, get together. But then there's also the data that sits on SharePoints or Google Drives that we can connect to. Then there's the data that's visualized in data visualization tools. And there I'm thinking about Power BI and Tableau. And that can be all kinds of you know, first party data that you use to visualize. Uh, then there's the data that you are subscriptions to. So for instance, you might have a Mintel or your monitor or you know, Forrester, you name it. All those sources are accessible through one search bar. And as an end user, I can type my query and whatever the organization knows or has access to internally or externally, including RSS feeds or links on the internet, et cetera, can be and will be surfaced in your search results. Now, the benefit is, as an end user, my experience is personalized. So if I work in, say, APAC for specific brands, I log in and I see that whatever is being suggested and surfaced to me actually knows who I am 
which makes that a much more pleasurable experience. Again, tying it to that consumer level experience that people are used to outside of the work environment and now expect within the work environment. Excellent, I, I love it. So um, of course, implementation with something like this isn't gonna be just a snap of the fingers. Um, I imagine, you know, just even as a market researcher, anytime I've had to work with multiple data sources, there's a lot of data engineering, as they say, right? You've got different you know, things that need to be matched. There can be an awful lot of work. If somebody's thinking that they might like to go down this road, but they have some concerns about, gosh, what's going to be the workload of integrating these different sources or bringing them into my hub? Can you tell us a little bit about what some of the practical planning considerations would be? And definitely. And I think one important matter is I think that as, as research professionals and insights professionals, I think we've we've been asked to do more with last for a very long, a long time now. Right. So I think uh, I think what we are offering is not a solution that is going to be time consuming, rather the opposite. So what we are actually when we come in and we have studies that basically go through this, we free up time. Uh, which means that even a thing like the actual setup and integration is something where we have specialists that will help and guide and navigate the whole transition process. And we will even help you in actually driving the behavioral change that you need to get in place to drive success and actual insights activation. So the way to think about it is if there's any interest, of course, reach out to us. Uh, we are able to go up, uh, go live much quicker than people actually think. Uh, it's it's a matter of weeks, uh, not months. So I think it's um, it's something that is that we, you know, working with the world's biggest organizations are very used to. We're used to handling very large data sets and very complex organizations across multiple continents. Excellent. So um, if somebody is thinking, gosh, you know, we have all this, you know, first party data and primary research data that we'd like to be bringing in, they will have to plan for, obviously, there's going to be some upfront integration and work, but it sounds like you have the team would be doing that work. Um, and then um, do you find that, w is it typical to then have more of like a phased rollout? Like we're going to start with maybe the primary research first and then bring in some of the first party data that we have. Um, is there a typical phased rollout for this kind of work because again so, i know the yes. i know the work is not inter, it's not insignificant even though you have the team it's Absolutely. still a lot of work no I, I think those are very good questions and and i'll i'll answer i'll answer them i think the, the way to think about it as a phased rollout is always desirable because you want to slice it up and be successful in at small stages and and that can be we've done it in many different ways it can be but you know per uh, per category, per brand, per region, it's really up to, you know, whoever, you know, what, what the different and, and co companies are so different, different in the level of decentralization, etc. So it's really, it'll be tailored to your organization. But I do believe, yes, a phase rollout is key, and then kind of drive success uh, across, you know, multiple parts of the organization sequentially. So that's the first answer. The second answer is, in regards to, you know, uh, primary research, et cetera. The different integrations is we, we agree on a plan on when and how we integrate these different data sources. And it might be that you want to get started because you feel that you have a bigger problem with information being siloed in certain pockets of the organization. And we effectively can plan and sequence in the same way. Uh, so, so it's, again, trying to understand your pains, your problems, your sources, and then afterwards devise solutions. And you'd be surprised how different organizations actually have um, different problems. It's, it's very, it's very different actually how um, the type of things they ask us to solve from that perspective. Is that primarily because they have different data sources, or is it more driven by who their business decision makers are and how they want their data presented? The, the org, org structures and their priorities. Interesting. Okay, I know I'm out of time with you, but. I have another question that just popped into my brain. Um, so pardon me for, for uh, uh, coming up with this at the very last second here, but as you were talking, I'm thinking about how people would think about their return on investment, You know how they would think about this. And one of the challenges I know for insights teams is you know, that horrible feeling of, we just did all this work, we delivered the, this amazing research and then nobody used it or we don't mm. know if they really used it. So obviously with a hub, you're gonna have usage statistics. Um, mm. So I was wondering, do you have any examples that you can share with me about the types of statistics people get from the hub so that they can say, yes, now we can see who's accessing the data and how often they're accessing the data. You know, what kinds of data are people looking at to 
to show that, yes, we have democratized insights and yeah. it is actually being used. Absolutely. I, I think that um, I, I think there, there, there's so much I'd like to say, uh, <laughs> but I think that uh, what we what we normally do is we we agree on a certain set of success metrics with whatever client we engage with. And it's like, how will you want to measure? We come with suggestions and it's typically it's really about individual individual uh, employees, uh, contributors and, the, you know, their frequency of use. Yeah, got it. Excellent. Thank you for letting me spring that question on to you at the last minute there. Um, so Thor, thank you so much. It's been a really interesting conversation. Obviously, um, the community that we serve here at Research Rockstar, we have a lot of teams who do struggle with disseminating information and, um, and engaging business decision makers who are always looking to do things faster, faster, faster. So um, uh, it's really exciting what you're working on. So congratulations on the growth of the company and thanks for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.